Hey, if we haven't got a chance to meet, my name is Chad. I'm the campus pastor of this location. I'm so glad you are here for part one of this new series, Family Matters. Uh, and here's the reality. Family matters to God, and therefore family matters. And we start a series by that title today. Uh, hopefully you caught the tie-in uh, from the bumper to the 90s sitcom by the same and if you're in the room and you don't know, you're too young and you should go. Uh, it's on Netflix or something somewhere. You can watch Family Matters. We're not going to do any skits or, or uh, guest appearances, although Nate really wanted to. Uh, we, had to we had to hold him back. But I was known as a kid every once in a while to use the line, did I do that um, when I did something wrong? Anybody else? Everybody ever use it? <laughs> and and here's, here's the thing. Family does matter. Families are a blessing from God. But let's be honest, just because they're a blessing from God doesn't mean they're not messy sometimes. <laughs> that relationships between spouses, parents, and children, and certainly between siblings can become complicated every once in a while. Uh, and all the parents raising multiple children at the same time said amen. <laughs> yeah, you know, because... But because family does matter, we still have to deal with matters of the family. You know, as a pastor over the last decade, I have sat with hundreds of families in different seasons of life. And I, I've had the unique privilege to sit in hospital rooms as people have welcomed newborn children. But I've also had to sit in funeral homes as people grieve tragic losses. I have sat with... Uh, couples in premarital counseling as they are preparing for not just their wedding but their marriage. And I've sat across from people on couches who were using the word divorce. I have sat with single people who have asked the question, am I ever going to get married? And then I have sat across the room from single people who said, thank God I'm finally out of that toxic relationship. And if I'm honest, I've not just sat across that uh, from people and, and had those conversations with with others, I've sat in my living room with my family and had some of those same conversations because life happens to all of us. You see, family life can bring us the greatest joy and also our greatest pains. Can anyone say I've experienced that? That's right. Like I've never wanted to hug people and choke people as much as I have my own family. <laughs> Anybody. I, I, and my mom was in the first service, and I told, this is a true story. It's not even a joke. It's a true story. I can remember, like, as a kid, my mom being like, I love you so much, son. And then, like, 10 seconds later, she would look at me, and she'd be like, I'm going to just, which was her way of saying, if you don't stop, I'm going to wring your neck. And, I, like, that was a common symbol in my house growing up was this right here. And I, that was my code for back down before mama loses it. <laughs> Anybody else ever explain, like, I love my kids, but you get on my nerves sometimes, too, because you don't act right. So we... <laughs> We, family is, is, is creates this dichotomy of emotion, of great joy, great pain. You know, as a matter of fact, there was one time a pastor, he was preaching a sermon to, to children, and he brought them up to the front and had them around him, and, and he was trying to prove this point that money can't buy everything, and so he asked the question. He said, hey, boys and girls, um, what, would it, what, what, what would you say if I said I'm going to pay you $1,000 to stop loving your mom and dad? And the Children kind of got quiet, didn't say anything. And finally, one little boy raised his hand in the back. And he said, preacher, how much you give me to stop loving my sister? <laughs> We've all had those thoughts. We've all had those feelings. You, you, you see, I guess I just wanted to start off today by pointing out to you this morning that you're probably more normal than you realize. That, that I've set across from a lot of families and a lot of couples and, and even single parents and single people, my wife and I in counseling in different moments in life at restaurants, we've sat across from people and we've said, hey, we've done that too. We've struggled with that too. We've faced those same things too. And I want to say that to you this morning that you're probably more normal than you realize. You're, you're not as alone as you think. We all have matters of the family that we have to deal with. You, you see, whether you've pondered questions like, do other couples argue like we do? Or should I, how should I discipline my kids? Or am I a good parent? To, to maybe questions like, do they still find me attractive? Am I the man she hoped I would be? 
Or does this guy even know where the laundry basket is at? (laughs) I want to tell you today that you're in good company. Because we all ask those questions. We all have those concerns. So today is a series that starts, but it's for all of us. No matter how big your family is, no matter how small your family is, no matter if you are a conventional couple with a husband and wife raising your kids or if you're a single parent, No matter if your family is large or small, no matter how long you've been married or how long you've been single, no matter how well-behaved or not so well-behaved your children are, family matters, and we all have matters of the family to deal with. So I want to encourage you as we start today to engage your hearts and minds as we get ready to prepare to hear from the Lord. Let's pray together before we dive into Scripture. Father, I thank you for what you've already done I thank you for the lives that were changed, salvations that happened in our first service. But God, I pray that you would do even more in this service. I pray, God, for the hearts and lives and families that are in this room, that you would give us ears to hear, you would give us a mind to comprehend, and God, you would give us a heart that's willing to be changed today. I pray, God, as I do often, that you would use me in spite of myself, in spite of my fears and my failures and all of my shortcomings, and that today, God, you would get all glory and all honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. The church said... Amen. So as we started to pray and look into this series as a team, uh, we, we landed on a, a pretty unlikely portion of Scripture for a series on family. And we felt like God took us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. And so as we deal with matters of the family, we are going to rewind back to the first book of the Bible. We're going to try to mine out gold nuggets that we feel like God has placed in there concerning family. In the first book of the Bible, the Holy Spirit reveals four very important keys that every family needs. And we're going to take those every week. And so we're going to talk about key number one. And here's what it says in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read the first three verses and then skip down to verse 24, 25. And we'll kind of fill the gaps in as we go along. Here's what it says in Genesis chapter 1. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. You skip down to verse 24, it says, God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So Genesis 1 is obviously the very beginning. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, You ever had a project in mind? Husbands, your wives ever sent you their Pinterest board and gave you a project for your mind? (laughs) And you knew what you were supposed to get to, but you really weren't sure where to start at? (laughs) I know that that's, I, I, we just bought a house back, a, a different house back in December. And before we moved in, I had the whole top remodeled. And I thought, I'm going to save myself some, some money and I'm going to remodel the bottom, the basement by myself. And, uh, and I found um, YouTube could teach you a whole lot. Um, it, it's helped me uh, with a lot of things. Demo's not real hard, you know, just busting stuff up and tearing stuff out. I can, I can do that. I, I'm not really a construction guy. I, that's, that's not my, my jam. That's not what I do a whole lot. And so I, I got it all up and I got it ready. I painted the walls and I thought, all right, time to put flooring down. And I watched a lot of YouTube videos and I thought, I can probably figure this out but I'm going to ask for some help. And so there's a guy in the church named Randy who's a construction background, and he had offered to help me. And so I called Randy, and I said, Randy, will you just help me get started? If you can help me get started, I think I can handle it from there. And uh, and Randy, I don't know if he had the spirit of discernment or or just once he started working with me, was like, this it's going to be bad if I leave him on his own. Um, And so he said, hey, Pastor Chad, I'll just help you with the whole thing. How about that? And I was like, that sounds like a great plan to me. And uh, and here's what I have learned over the last month as we were closing in on on finishing the basement is, um, one, it was harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, It would have took longer than I wanted it to. And and I probably would have been able to figure it out, but it wouldn't look as good as it does now because I had somebody helping me that knew what they were doing. As I thought about that and I thought about this series, and I thought that's really a pretty good picture of, of our life and our families, is that on our own, we'll probably figure it out, but it's 
going to be harder than we thought. It's going to take longer than we wanted it to. And it's not going to, it's not going to turn out as good as it could. And so my hope for you today as we start this series is that during these conversations, there'll be some things that kind of are illuminated or spark interest or, or, or do something in your heart that are going to, whether you've been, whether you've been in your family or been raising kids or been doing this a long time or you're really, really new, no matter what season of life you may be in as a family, that something will happen that you'll say, because of that, because of what the Lord showed me, I think my family's going to be better, it's going to be easier, and it's going to turn out in a way that it wouldn't have if I had done it on my own. And there's always a beginning point. That's what we see here in Genesis, a starting point for everything in life. God knew that he would create the universe. And he also knew that there would be a starting point when he created the family. Beginnings are very important and in most cases will determine the outcome. If the beginning is not right, the ending usually won't be either. So in the first few words of Genesis, we see the first thing God establishes for the family. It's important. The first thing is important. What's the, what's the first thing you do when you build a house? You lay the foundation. Like, what's the first layer of makeup for a woman? Foundation. That's what they tell me anyways. Pastor Gary wrote that line in the message, and so I'm just using his illustration. <laughs> All right, foundation. Because foundation is the most important thing. If we want to have anything be solid and stable and steady, then there has to be the right foundation. If you want your family to be solid and stable and steady, it has to have the right foundation. And the foundation for every family is this, is to have the right order in your life. Order, if you define it by the dictionary, is this. It's a sequence, an arrangement, the way one thing follows another, the condition in which everything is controlled as it should be is in its right place, and performing its correct function. Nothing works well when it's out of order. And we could spend a lot of weeks discussing all the aspects of order in a family, but today we're going to narrow it down to just a few basic fundamentals by looking at what order produces in our families and in our lives. And here's the first thing that order produces. Order produces security in your life and in your family's life. In verse 3 of Genesis chapter 1, it's where God said, let there be light. Now, what's the first thing you do when you are awakened in the middle of the night to a strange sound outside your home? You wake your wife up and say, hey, we go check out and see what that is. I'm kidding. I heard heard a few answers I won't repeat. Most of us, most of us. We're going to do what? We're going to get up and we're going to turn the light on and we're going to see what's going on. What's the first thing you do when you walk into a dark room? You find the light switch. You you, you see, light removes the unknown because things hide in the dark. Light reveals your environment. You can see your surroundings. Light repels deception. You can see things clearly. In Psalm 119, verse 105 It says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That same chapter in Psalms, verse 130, it says, the entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus would say this. He said he spoke to the people once more and he said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You see, You could put it this way, light produces security. When you go into that dark room and you turn the light on, all of a sudden you are able to see where you need to go. When you you hear something outside and you turn the light on to the porch, you realize it was just the neighbor's cat and you're at ease. Light produces security. In the beginning of Genesis, he produced light. It's the order in which he started because he knew that that order would bring security. When, when there is order in the family, there is an environment of security for everyone. So does your family feel safe and secure? Is there a sense of normalcy and routine within your family? Or when you think of your family and, and the way your life is ran, do you see it as chaotic and cluttered? 
And you say, well, Chad, I, that, this sounds great, but I would, how do I practically, and today, let's be honest, today's message is a little less hype and a little less spiritual, and it's a lot more practical, um, which is good, that we can walk out and do something. And so you're saying, how do I practically create some order in my life? How do I cra- practically create order within my family? I, I think here's a, here's a few ideas that we could throw out. Is One, it's very simple, and, and you, may, you may say, Chad, I, I was coming for something more profound. I'm sorry, that's not what you're going to get today. <laughs> but the first question I would ask you is, do you even just have a routine? Do you have a daily routine? Or do you hit the snooze button too much? Do you... Rush your kids out of bed in a whirlwind, throw some clothes that don't match, and hopefully get to work on time. Or do you have a routine? Do you have a schedule? Do you sit down with your family and have dinner on a regular basis where you put your phone away, you turn your TV off, and you engage in conversation with them? Because that's a way that you create security. That's a way you get to know them. That's a way you get to to engage and have have real-life conversation with them. Let me ask you this. Do you have a time where you do family devotions together. You see, my family, we have a nighttime routine. As a matter of fact, I, I brought my Bible today, but I left it back in the hospitality room, and I, I brought this Bible to the platform with me. It's the beginner's Bible. It's, I guess you could say it's my Bible. My parents gave it to me in 1997, um, but it's my kid's Bible now. And, and we have a routine nearly every night. It starts about 8 o'clock, and, and I'll be honest, you know how the routine starts? We argue with our kids. <laughs> time to brush your teeth, time to brush your hair, um, time to put on pajamas, right? And, and then you get the wrong pajamas, and that becomes an ordeal. But once everything gets settled, we have another routine. <laughs> in that routine, we go in to our girls' bedrooms, we set them down on the bed, and we read this book together. We read, we've read it countless times through. It's, the stories are short, and the pictures are big, and... And we read other stuff too, Llama Llama, Red Pajama. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I read it all. And our kids fuss sometimes. Do we have to read the Bible? Yeah, because <laughs> this is my house, and, and I pay these bills, <laughs> and I'm raising you, and you're going to read this Bible. <laughs> and then we, we sing songs, and, and we have a routine of songs. We Usually the It's a Bitsy Spider, and then some other songs that their mama sings that I don't know. Um, but we always close with the same song every night. Jesus loves me, this I know. Right? And we, we, we sing this song together. And it's our routine. Before I leave house, the house in the morning, I grab my girls and I grab my wife and my daughters and I pray over them. And I pray the same prayer almost every day. I pray, God, help my girls learn a lot and laugh a lot today. And help mama have an easy day at work. And we, and we pray that over them. And it's a, it's a routine. My girls at night, before we go to bed, they pray. And it's neat now because they're, they're almost four and almost six, and they're getting to the point where they can pray on their own. They can say their own prayers, but it didn't start off that way. It started off with me saying, hey, baby, say this prayer with me. And, I would, and that's how I taught them. And that's how I'm teaching them how to have a conversation with God. And it's a routine. And, you know, and I, was thinking about, I was thinking about this Bible, and, <clears throat> and it really symbolizes the power of order in my life. You say, well, even, even more than just in my own family's life, my, when I'm raising my kids, but when my mom and my dad gave me this book in 1997, you don't know the five years before 1997. You don't know that they were divorced. You don't know that I had a stepdad. You don't know that life was really chaotic. And then mom and dad got remarried in March of 97. And, and then they gave me this book in October of 97. They got remarried on a Friday night. My mom went to church on a Sunday. The very next Sunday, gave her life to Jesus, and she started raising us in church. And she, she would get us this, and, and she would read this book with us every night. And we would read it. In my, in my office just over here, I've got another book of devotionals for, that, that she would gather me and my brother before we got on the school bus every morning as kids, and she would read that with us. And she would take us to church, and she, and she didn't give us an option. <laughs> you know, and, and, we, and, that was, and, then, and then a few years later, my dad got saved. And then me and my brother got saved. And now... Now we all live here together. My, my brother and I are in ministry, and it all came because they made a decision to create an order. You know, I don't know about you, but I want to challenge you. If you don't have an order of a routine in your family, it was, it'll create security. It'll create, it, it'll create an intimacy. It will create a, a closeness between you and your, and your children. And, and, and I don't care if you're, if you're a single parent 
or if you're not a single parent but you're the only one in church, you do it and you push that, you push that routine. And I promise you, even on the days your kids buck at you, even on the days your kids don't want to do it, you will look back years to come and you'll say, I'm so glad that I didn't give in and that I didn't stop the routine, that I kept staying faithful. You see, order will create security. Another thing that order will produce in your life is growth. When you have order, things grow. That's why in verse 11 of Genesis chapter 1, it says, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit that yields fruit, the, the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed in itself on the earth, and it was so you. So there was this, this order. They created the land, and then they created the trees, and the trees began to produce fruit, and there was this growth. There was this growth. You see, order creates an environment for growth. When you have order in your home, things will grow. Yeah, physically, things are going to grow. Your kids are going to grow. You're going to grow. I, I said, I'm a, I'm a, I stopped growing up. I just started growing out now. Um, <laughs> that was a joke. Come on, nobody else. <laughs> but, but not just physically. There are, when you have order in the home, relationships grow, emotions grow, Socially, you'll grow. Mentally, you'll grow. Your communication with your family will grow. Your, the way you discipline will develop and grow. Caring for one another will grow. The way you manage your finances, the, 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 the way you, your spiritual life, it'll all begin to grow when you have order. You see, growth is a natural process for anything that is healthy. If something is not growing, the reason is usually because it is not healthy. And when you have health in your home and an order brings health, there will be a, an environment for growth within you and within your family. God intends for his creation to grow and produce fruit. There's an author by the name of Carol Dweck, and, and she wrote a book about this. And in that, she said there are two basic mindsets people have. The first one is a fixed mindset. And she says, that assumes that our character, intelligence, and creative ability are static. In other words, a person's mind is a, in a fixed position without the ability to grow. And then she said, the other mindset is a growth mindset. And it thrives on challenge. It sees failure not as evidence of unintelligence, but as a springboard for growth and for stretching and for existing and, and, and growing our abilities. And here's what I just thought. I want to be the type of person who always has a growth mindset. I want to have the type of family whose mindset is always growth. You see, everything that God created on planet Earth has the ability to grow. Order in your family gives an environment for growth. So maybe ask the question today, in what area does your family need to grow? Do you need to grow in how you communicate with each other? Do you need to grow in the way you discipline your children? Do you need to grow in the way you care for one another? Do you need to grow in the way you manage your finances? Do you need to grow in your spiritual life? And here's homework assignment today. It's to identify Here's one area of our life. And maybe this is a conversation that you have with your spouse tonight or if your kids are old enough to, to engage in a conversation like this. Maybe it's a conversation you go and have with your children and as, as a family unit tonight to, and you say, hey, what's an area that you think we could grow in? And you, and you hone in on that and then you ask God, give me wisdom on how to create order so I can grow in this area of my life. You see, make your own list and pick one. This week, another thing that order does is order creates divine flow. Order creates a divine flow, and I'll explain what that means. All of what God did in the six days of creation was within a divine flow. It had a natural order. You see, each day God had an order. Each day followed that order to the next. So what, put it this way. Um, the fish were not created until the water was in place. <laughs> Right? That'd have been a bad deal if he'd have flipped it around and all the fish were flopping and 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 then and then he the animals and the birds didn't get created until the land was ready and the trees were ready and the fruit was being produced because there was a flow there was a way that God did it we well, said we have when we have our families in order we position ourselves for God's divine flow and purpose in our life when we are out of order then we miss the divine flow of God I want to tell you this order. It does not restrict the power and purposes of God. It enhances them. Years ago, I was taught this, and I've taught it, I've taught it a lot since then, that glory follows order. 
You say, how, what does that mean? That means I believe the power of God, the presence of God, the purposes of God, the glory of God, it follows order. You say, how do you know that? You, you flip back into the Old Testament when God gave Israel the blueprints to to build the temple, and he gave them exact measurements. He gave them exact types of material. He gave them exact colors. And the Bible says that when they followed God's plan and they went in the order God told them to and they built the temple according to that order, that the glory of God filled the temple. And it's just this picture that when we have order, the glory of God follows that order. That when we have order, that we have a divine flow in our lives. And so I don't know about you, but if you could use a little bit of Divine flow, divine intervention, more of God's power, purpose, presence in your life. Maybe you need to have a little more order. Is there something out of order in your life that's keeping you from experiencing the power and purpose of God in your life? Here's the last thing that we're going to talk about today. It's not the exhaustive list that we believe God, divine order is produced from, and is this, that divine, divine order or Having order in your life produces peace. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, you flip over to the next chapter, it says that he rested from all of his work. So six days of creating the world, let there be light. And light comes and he creates the, the boundaries of the land and he creates uh, the seas and he creates the animals and he creates uh, all, all the trees. And, 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 then, and at the end of all of that, it says he just took a rest. Because when your family... When your family is in order, there will be peace. Now, understand, that doesn't mean there's going to be perfection, but there will be peace when you have order in the home. Is your family filled with chaos? And I'm not talking about everyday things that happen that are just part of life. I'm not talking about the normal stuff. I'm referring to continued chaos, to real stress. Do you feel a sense of hopelessness? If so, today would be a good day to ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And I'll tell you, everything starts with a plan. You know, before, I'll, before I perform a marriage ceremony, I always, as part, of our, as part of our procedure here at the church, is we always require six weeks of premarital counseling with the couple. And two weeks a couple named Matt and Michelle, they were in the first service. They're going to get married. I'm going to do the, the ceremony for them. We just finished six weeks of premarital counseling. And on week one, I did with them what I've done with every couple I've ever walked through with that. And on week one, the very first thing I do is I, is I tell them the most important thing for your marriage outside of being committed to God is you have to have a vision for your marriage. And see, we are people, they'll create visions for their family or or for their education, for their career, for their for their exercise, for their weight. They'll create all this vision. But so often we we fail to have a vision for our family. I mean, where do you want your family to be at in five years? Where do you want your marriage to be at in five years? Where do you want your relationship with your kids to be at in two years? Where do you want your spiritual life to be at with your family in a few months? Where do you because what you have to have a plan to get there? You have to have a vision. You have to have a vision. Everything starts with a plan. Everything starts with a vision. And I would encourage you that, that maybe to take some time and, and, and pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you divine ideas. Sit down with it. I always, I always tell the same couples in premarital counseling, I said one of the best things you will do outside of having a relationship with Jesus is you will, if you will model yourselves after the right couples. If you'll get around families that are, that are doing things in a way that seem right. If you, one of my closest friends in the world is a guy named Justin. He's on our staff, and and I made him my friend because I saw the way his wife and, and his, their relationship was, and I saw the way he was as a father, and I said that's how I want to be one day, and became my friend, and and I modeled my life after that. And you see, maybe getting around families or getting around people that say, hey, I want to be where they are someday. They're a little bit down the road, and yeah, not everything's perfect, right? Because, because not every, it takes 20 pictures to get the one that you actually post, right? Not everything is perfect, but it's good, and it's God-honoring, and I think I can learn from them. You see, order matters in your family. But I want to tell you this as we get ready to close. If you're going to have order in your family, You're going to have to have order in your own life. It would be very hypocritical of us to go home and have a family meeting tonight and say, we're going to have order now, but I don't have any order in my own life. 
I want to talk to you. And this isn't part of the notes. It's a freebie. <laughs> you may want to return it later, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. I want to talk to the men in the room and tell you, don't, don't dare go home and try to create order in your family until you've decided you're going to create order in your own life. You're the man of the house. You're the spiritual leader of your home. Yes, you co-labor in that with your spouse if you're married. But, but your, your wife and your children, they flourish based upon your spiritual leadership towards them. And it's your responsibility. God, he, he placed an, a, a, an anointing and a mantle over your life when you committed into a relationship with him and with your family. And he has called you to be the leader of your home. And don't, dare, don't you dare go in and try to create order in your home until you've created order in your own life. You say, what does that look like? Well, yeah, it means the practical stuff. Have a consistent routine. Have disciplines. But it also means that you have to have order in your priorities. That's where I want to wrap this up, is order in your priorities. I remember a few years ago, um, I was off social media entirely for a few years, and then COVID happened, and, and the church asked me to get back on social media um, during, our, during our online time, and, and I didn't really want my own thing anymore, so I just tagged my name onto my wife's account, and so nobody really knows what I do. It just says, like, I'm a dental hygienist and, uh, and all this stuff about my wife, and I make snarky comments and let everybody wonder who actually said it. Um, <laughs> But before that, <laughs> before that, I, I had, I remember when I did have social media, there was this part when they, when there was an update one, one time, and they let you put a bio in, like, what's your bio? Uh, and, um, and I remember thinking about that, and I, and I wrote four words, and, and if you were to ask me today, Chad, what's, what's the order, what's the priority order of your life, or what does that look like? I'd tell you those same four words, and they're in a very specific order for me. And here's those four words. I'm a Christian, I'm a husband, I'm a father, and then I'm a pastor. And that's the order of my life. And I, and I put it in a very specific order because here's what I know. I have to be a Christian before anything. Or I'm going to be terrible at everything. <laughs> I have to be a man of God and I have to follow God and, I, and, I, and because I can't love my wife and I can't love my kids and I certainly can't pastor the church if I don't make sure that I'm following him the way that I need to. And so the number one order of priority in my life is that I'm a follower of Jesus. And so what does that mean for me? That means I get up early and I read my Bible. That means I spend time in prayer. That means I, I listen to worship music. That means I'm in accountability with people. That means I go to life group. That means I show up to church on Sunday. You do that because you're a pastor. No, I did it long before I was a pastor. And I don't, I don't do any of those things because of my title. I do that because I'm a follower. That's, that's number one. And then the second thing is, is I'm a husband. And we have to be careful because if we're not, if we're not careful, we'll, we will swap that title with being a parent. But I believe it's important that our children see us as husband and wife before they see us. I was a husband before I was a daddy. And I don't need my daughters to ever have to look outside the home to know what a man of God is and to know what it's like to have a husband. My daughters need to see me love their mama. And so that's, that's what I, that I'm a husband and so, yeah, we just got back from vacation. And he said, did you take the kids? No, because vacation with your kids is not vacation. <laughs> you feel bad for leaving at home for like three seconds? And then I was like, nope, you're really enjoying being a husband right now, right? <laughs> I, why, why do you do that? Because my kids need to see me invest in my relationship with my wife. And no, eight years ago when we were poor, I couldn't go to Mexico, right? It didn't always look like that. Sometimes it looked like the Holiday Inn in Jackson, Tennessee for a night. And that was the way we invested. But it's important to me. And the next thing is I'm a father. And, and what I mean by that is that I'm, a, I'm an engaged father in my kids' lives. I'm not just someone who provides and is, 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 is semi aware of what's going on in my kids' lives around me. Here's what I, what I try to do is I try, and it's really hard. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to trump it up or lie to you. It's the most difficult thing for me to do, but I try to delight in what they delight in. I have never once in my life found true delight in Barbie dolls or fingernail painting. You know, it's, I live with all women right now. It's like a disco ball blew up in my house. There's glitter everywhere. I have never once <laughs> found real delight in it, but I have, to, I have to delight in 
what they delight in. I have to engage in. I have to do that with my wife. I have to do that. I, I, we, were, we just got back from vacation. I went to a jungle spa in Mexico. That's, I don't do that. I'm like, hey, Chad, what are you going to do this weekend? Want to go to a jungle spa? Absolutely not. But I was delighting in what my wife delighted in, mainly because it involved a taxi ride, and I wasn't going to send her in a taxi in a foreign country by herself. <laughs> But, but I remember last summer I walked into, I walked into a gas station and, uh, and I had put on like some slide flip-flops just to run into the gas station. And I looked down and I was like, holy smokes, my toenails are blue. <laughs> right? And my dad's in there. He's like, son, you got blue toenails? And I was like, dad, hush, don't draw any attention to this. Why? Trying to delight in what they delight in. And so I'm a follower I'm a husband, I'm a father, and then I'm a pastor. So I feel like part of my life calling is I belong to you, but I belong to you after I belong to them. And I make no apologies to that. On the day I married my wife, we wrote our own vows, and one of the vows I wrote was I will never pastor the church more than I pastor my home because I was never going to give up them for you. And I don't mean that ugly. Please don't see that <laughs> as, a, as a disdain. But they're the number one priority. And, and, and maybe you're here today and, and the Holy Spirit's kind of giving you that nudge, right? I always say the Holy Spirit has an elbow. I usually feel it right here. He's usually giving me that little nudge right in my... Maybe you feel that today as we talk about order and we talk about priority, that you're feeling that, that little nudge of the Holy Spirit highlighting a part of your life to say, hey, this is an area we need to work on. This is an area we need... To develop, you see, do you need to do you need to change the order of your priorities so you can have order in your family? So get ready to close. I want to ask you, will you stand all across the room with me? I want to spend some time praying with you. And usually I would I would say, Hey, let's raise your hand if you need this, or raise your hand if you need that. And in a moment I will for a certain prayer, but for this prayer, I don't feel like I, I need you to Raise your hand because I feel like everybody in the room, if you listen today, probably has an area of your life that you would look at and say, that needs to be changed. I need to create a different order of priorities or I need to have order in this area of my life or I need to really grow in this part of my family life. And today I just want to spend some time praying for you. And here's the two prayers that I want to pray. I want to pray that God would give you the right order of priorities for your own life. I would venture to say they're probably not going to be too different from mine. That you're going to be a, father, a follower. If you're married, you're going to be a spouse. If you have the, the luxury of being a parent, you're going to be a parent. And then your career is going to follow somewhere in there. But the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom on what priority you need to work on. And then I'm going to pray this. I'm going to pray as, that the Lord would highlight one thing that is out of order for you to work on this week. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for my church family today. God, as I talk about that order of priorities and I talk about, God, the, the things you've done in my own life, God, I, I pray my heart's been shown that I didn't always get that right. And there are days today that I still don't get it right. There are days, Father, that I, that I can be selfish. There are days that I can want to give myself too much to work or too much to a hobby. But I'm thankful that because of my, my sensitivity to you, I can always sense those nudges saying, no, don't miss in this moment. Don't miss this opportunity with your family. And I, and I pray, God, for the people in this room that right now the way the Holy Spirit deals with me would deal with them. And you would begin to help them rearrange the orders of priority. Begin to help them, God. Say, hey, this is not bad, but, but you're missing out. This is, this is not something you have to eliminate, but you have to rearrange. God, I pray that we would be a people who you always win and then our families win. And then everything else after that, we would divvy up appropriately. And I pray, God, for everybody in this room. I pray that they would somehow... Through the, through the nudging, the promptings of the Holy Spirit and 
through some pondering and some inward reflection, that the Holy Spirit would highlight one thing in their life this week, one, one area of their life, and that it would be very specific to them, and they would know, this is what I need to work on this week. Maybe they need to work on how they communicate with each other. Maybe they need to work on how they, how they communicate with their children. Maybe they need to work on not working too much this week and clocking out when they're supposed to and getting home for dinner. God, maybe they need to work on setting the alarm clock a little earlier, getting up and spending some time with you before they spend time with anybody else. I don't know what it is, but I pray, God, that you would show it to them. You'd make it very apparent to them. And then you'd give them this unique, creative idea on how to biblically and responsibly approach that area of their life. That you would bring order, and that order would bring security. That order would bring growth. That order, God, would bring a divine flow. And that order in their life would bring peace. God, I feel that in my heart. I pray for the families and the homes in this room, for the married couples and the single parents and the, and the single individuals, for the, for the grandparents, for the, the siblings, for the children, or whatever area, God, that, that they, they don't feel at peace in their home. And I pray, God, that that wouldn't be true any longer. I pray that, that our homes would feel safe our homes would be places of peace and rest. God, that we wouldn't pull into our driveways and, and be reserved about walking in because we are afraid of what we're going to encounter. But God, I pray that our homes would be a place where we find rest and we find peace, we find security, we feel safe, God. I pray that for the person in this room who doesn't always enjoy going home, that this week would be different. Something would change. And there would be a safety and there would be a peace about it, God. I thank you, God, that you're going to show that to us, make it real to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. The church said? Amen. Amen. Before we transition to the next part of our service, I'd, I do want to spend some time praying for another prayer. It's a prayer we pray every week. Because here's what I know. If you're in this room, and you've not given your life to Jesus, you've not surrendered your life to him, then your life's never going to be in the right order. doesn't mean there's not going to be some sense of normalcy. It just means there's always going to be a peace missing. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, if you're not submitted to his will for your life, I don't say this to, to scare you or intimidate you. I'm just saying this is, this is my job as a pastor to tell you what I believe the word of God says is this that your life is always going to be a little bit out of whack until you surrender to him. That's not exactly how it says in the Bible. That's my way of saying it. But, but you get what I'm saying. And so today I want to invite you to make the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. I want to invite you to pray the most simple but powerful prayer you will ever pray in your life. And that's to invite Jesus into your heart. Surrender your life to him. Come into a relationship and watch everything about you change. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, here's my promise. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make a spectacle out of you. I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm not going to go to where you're at. We're just going to go to where he is right now. Only thing I'm going to ask you to do is on the count of three, if that's you today, you need to make that decision. I want you to raise your hand so my faith can join your faith and we can bombard heaven together. So on the count of three today, if you say, I need to make that decision, I want to lead you in that prayer. One, two, three. Is there anybody here today? see this hand right here. Is there anybody else? I see that hand in the, in the risers. Is there anybody else today? For those of you who raised your hand or maybe you didn't, but you know you should have, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Church family, let's do what we do every week. Let's lead them in this prayer together. And if, you, if you're praying this prayer, I want you to mean it in your heart. Say it with your lips and everything's going to change for you right now. Church family, let's lead them. Dear Jesus, I acknowledge that I need you. I repent of my sins. I repent of my attitudes, my actions, and my addictions. Today, God, I ask you to bring order to my life. And in this moment, I, I make a declaration that I am yours and you are mine. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, can we celebrate with all the people who just prayed that prayer?
for the very first time.